Hello, check. Hello, hello.
very good evening to everyone. So um, welcome you all to this uh, institute um, lecture um, by Professor Kulikalama Jain. So let me invite our director, Professor Jain Murthy, to introduce the speaker. For this. Yeah, I think we'll begin. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think uh, very good, good evening to all of you. It's indeed a very delightful evening. And uh, it's after a long time that we are, you know, sort of able to get together like this. And if you may, some of you may recall, we had this some time back, about eight or nine months back, when Dr. Ramaswamy basically visited our campus. And we had set up the talk like this in an open environment. And at this time, the whole country is going through the scare of Omicron. And we are also in the midst of that. In fact, asked quite a few students to leave the campus. Notwithstanding all that, I think now we have understood Omicron much better than how it was two weeks back. And, and that's how we dared to sort of have this particular talk here because we have a very eminent scientist visiting us from the United States. And uh, this scientist with astounding credentials emanates from the same very land. In fact, received his education from Trivandrum. So I thought we should have this talk in the open environment. And that's the best way to basically salute him for the contributions that he has made to chemical sciences, and material sciences, uh, materials engineering in particular. So let me introduce the speaker of today, Professor uh, Pulikil Madhav Anikar uh, Ajayan, popularly called MP, uh, PM Ajayan. We could speak in terms of Prime Minister Ajayan, <laughs> but sitting somewhere else in, in the University of, uh, I mean, Rice University in, in Houston, Texas, United States of America. Well, I think uh, let me give a brief uh, rundown of his uh, VT and uh, bio. He hails from a you know, coastal town called Kodungalur in Trishur district of Kerala. And of course, uh, had a, you know, primary education there, came to Trivandrum to, for higher education, moved from here to BHU, IT BHU. Uh, Banaras Hindu University for his B.Tech in Metallurgical Engineering that was in 1985 and from there he moved to the Northwestern University to pursue his PhD and received his PhD in 1989 and spent subsequently three years as a postdoctoral uh, fellow in NEC Corporation in Japan and moved from there to France uh, to a place called Orsay and spent there two years and moved from there to Germany as a Humboldt fellow, spent one and a half year, and eventually joined in 1997 the Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute as an assistant professor. There was a chair professor there in the name of Henry Burlock, chair professor in engineering up until 2007, and he accepted the offer from Rice University from what I understand, and joined Rice University in 2007, July, and which is where he has since been. Professor Ajayan's research interests are very broad and a focus on nanomaterials, development for variety of applications such as energy storage, composites, electronics, and sensors. And he is considered one of the pioneers in the area of nanotubes, carbon nanotubes. Of course, uh, most startling thing is a person who has published about at this age more than 1,000 publications. And uh, astonishing it is that, you know, his H-index is well over 200. And the citations are beyond in excess of 1,80,000. That is really humongous. We cannot fathom. I don't, I don't know of anybody from India with such high citations. For his mammoth contributions, he has gone on to win several accolades and awards from time to time. The list is really long. I, I, uh, this is not basically going through all of them, but most notable being the Senior Humboldt Prize from Germany, 
and of course he's a fellow of us national academy of inventors and uh, he has he has been conferred with the lifetime achievement nanotechnology award in houston technology center he's on the advisory board of several journals that deal with material science and engineering and of course nanotechnology he's also been a visiting professor to several countless institutions across the globe i think of course it's a pleasure to have him amongst us it's a veritable joy indeed a person with such stupendous credentials is is here at this time with us and and uh, we thought we should have this kind of a talk i think with that may i now invite professor ajay to give a talk on strive striving for excellence and whatever that comes along with it. professor ajay Change, change your settings. Monitor, you can. Yeah. <clears throat> well, good evening, uh, and thank you, Professor Murthy, for such kind words. <clears throat> you know, uh, many things special about this lecture today. I, for example, I mean, I've never given a lecture to an audience sitting out in the open. Facing the mountains in a beautiful weather like this, uh, so that itself is wonderful. Secondly, you know, I decided that uh, perhaps for a change, we'll talk about something else rather than really core material science, which has been my field for a very long time. Uh, in fact, I have given a couple of lectures here already before the pandemic on materials and two D materials, particularly. Uh, so this is going to be slightly different and the genesis of this is really uh, when I was visiting a few IITs this year, uh, some of the directors asked me to give or at least talk to the students about what academic excellence is and uh, that kind of made me think a little bit and uh, uh, you know, so th this is really uh, some kind of a personal journey into what I have done uh, over the years and uh, what as a department chair and as a senior professor uh, thinks about academic research and what excellence means. Uh, of course, <clears throat> you know, excellence in research particularly is a very difficult thing to uh, assess because, uh, you know, you can talk about metrics these days very easily. As uh, Professor Murthy said, you know, H index and things like that. But that doesn't necessarily uh, oftentimes count to the only criteria for excellence. Uh, you know, there has been Nobel Prize winners with just 10 papers, right? So, uh, you know, their the excellence can come in various different ways. And breakthroughs are difficult to explain oftentimes. Uh, but it's a long-term sustain, uh, sustainable effort that sometimes uh, we consider excellent. Uh, and again, from a personal side, from a department side, from an institutional side, <clears throat> I think we all have in our mind some ideas of what excellence is and uh, you know perhaps what i'm going to say uh, or talk today is uh, a few of my own impressions on what those points could be and again as you know i come from uh, a very old institution for at least from the u.s standards rice university uh, you know 100 years old 100 plus years old we celebrated our 100 years a few years ago and it's a very unique place and in some sense reflects what ICER is here. A very small university in the U.S. standards, uh, only about 6,000 students, including undergraduates and graduates, uh, you know, compared to places like, uh, uh, you know, Ohio State, which has 50,000 students. So it's a really small private school. Uh, but even being so small, we are ranked, again, ranking is another criteria that we often look at. Uh, in the top 20 universities, we are uh, last few years we've been ranked 16th in the country. Uh, so, you know, in, in that sense, you can see, you know, where uh, the excellence is coming from, right? Uh, how people look at you. Uh, you know, most of the time, uh, these are all essentially the grades given by your peers, right? And if US News and World Reports or some other ranking system <laughs> tells you that you are really in the top 20, uh, we take it. Uh, in a good way and uh, you know and again there are criteria there are very specific ways of looking at these things 
Uh, but we are proud to be in the top 20 for many years now, even being a small university. And later on in my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about our own department, which was created a few years ago. And even being so small, you can see how we have created an ecosystem where people can actually uh, think loud and publish well and you know, train excellent students. Uh, so the, the, those all constitute uh, excellence in terms of academic research. Now, before I start talking about some of those points, let me also point out, you know, some of the key technologies that are changing the world. Um, you know, in fact, uh, if you look at this pandemic, what has happened? Uh, it, it has been a terrible two years in many ways, in terms of students, uh, for us teachers who are doing Zoom all the time. Uh, but that being said, you know, without the kind of technologies that we have developed over the last decade, this would have been really a much worse situation, right? And it's simply because of all these wonderful science advances and technologies that came out of it, that we have been able to really continue our life as it used to be. Perhaps some changes and that will be long-standing changes, but we have to give it to the people behind these you know, technologies and scientists who really worked enormous hours to build what we have. And that has helped us enormously during this time. And whether it is mobile devices, the internet, uh, and the amazing things that internet has shown us. And many of those things are coming, right? The robotics is just beginning to happen. <coughs> engineering in biology, genetic engineering is going to completely revolutionize society. So I think it's all the advances of technology that has not just changed the infrastructure and the gadgets that we use, but society itself. The behavioral aspects, you know, we are, ourselves are changing because we live in a society that is really surrounded by <coughs> these things. And foundational to many of those things are materials. You know, in every technology that is listed in that uh, uh, slide, you can see the advent of materials at some level. Now, somebody said those who control materials control technology. And I think it's very true, right? Whether it is a silicon technology that is basically completely you know, change the computer industry to perhaps the next level of sophistication, you know, nanotechnology to all the way to quantum materials and quantum technologies. All these are going to have huge impacts in our lives. And I think as scientists and engineers, we should be proud that we are in this profession. And, uh, you know, uh, I was talking to Professor Murthy, and he was talking about the sense of belonging, sense of ownership, you know, to the place that you are here. But I think you know there's also there should also be a sense of belonging and ownership to science per se. You know we are all practitioners of this field and we all are connected in that uh, you know through that language. And I think it's extremely important for us to realize that uh, we are in perhaps the best profession that anybody can offer. <clears throat> and again, you know this goes very much to the students who are trying to think of what their future is going to be. You know, just my advice is be in science. You know, we continue to be practitioners of this uh, amazing uh, you know, profession. <clears throat> so this is my group, again, a snapshot, uh, you know, taken maybe a few years ago before actually the pandemic. Uh, you know, it's, it's a cross section of people from all over the world. Uh, and again, I, I'm sure that, you know, any research group that you take, uh, even here, will be a cross section of people from different states. And it, it is that part also that really, you know, brings in fulfillment. So working with people from different parts of the world, working with people, uh, different states, speaking different languages, you know, with different traditions and culture. Uh, I think that, that's the other aspect of doing science. You know, I've been in many different countries. I've stayed and worked in different labs in different countries. And those experiences are just uh, uh, incredible. You, know, you can't really have any other thing that would match such uh, experience. Uh, and again, you know, these different people from different backgrounds and, you know, again, economic backgrounds, cultural background, they all bring different <laughs> aspects to a lab like this and they contribute differently. And, uh, you know, together we create, you know, what we call the scientific excellence or technology. <clears throat> now, if you think about a university, you know, the ideal definition of a university. You know, this comes. This quote comes to my mind. Actually, I saw this in your uh, office. Uh, 
the Samudri. This is uh, taken from Gitanjali, Tagore's uh, the greatest uh, prose of poetry that talks about what freedom is and you know where the mind is without fear. So that is basically the foundation of what uh, people like us should be, the environment we should be in, right? Thinking freely, talking to people, discussing freely, right? And uh, really, uh, you know, that kind of openness is what really brings in uh, the best of us. And, you know, I, I, I keep telling my students that, uh, you know, th th there is no constraint, there is no restriction for you to think. You know, yes, maybe you are on a particular project, but think broadly, think sideways, think backwards. I <laughs> think, you know, the, the wonderful things that are lying on the by side might be the best thing that you would ever find. And, you know, this freedom of expression and freedom of thinking is extremely important in any, you know, academic environment. And that has to be fostered. You know, many times that gets curtailed for various reasons. And I think that, you know, we all have to take an active part in making sure that that freedom of expression and thinking is not curtailed. And uh, again, I can't think of a better verse than, you know, this thing taken from Gitanjali. Uh, and again, you know, the picture that you're seeing is actually the culmination of many years of work, our convocation, where the faculty and students get together, they're hooded, they, are, uh, they, they get their degrees. But the message that we always give is that, you know, this few years that you have spent in this institution doing your PhD, uh, it's perhaps the best of your life. And, you know, this is not just a remembrance that you have worked hard, but also a remembrance that uh, you have worked with other people. You have been mentored. You know, you have been fostered. Uh, and there are many, many other <laughs> aspects of education, not just the basic, uh, uh, you know, uh, training that you got in your core field uh, that is going to go with you. So I think that, you know, that, that beauty in this uh, uh, togetherness and, uh, you know, uh, collaborative atmosphere that you have gone through is going to be your strength throughout your career. So in terms of, you know, institutions and universities, we have to foster that, uh, that togetherness, that belonging. I think that's a very nice word that really has to be in your mind. You know, we all belong to a place and we have to really show our best so that the institution will foster into an excellent uh, uh, criteria. Now, I mean, of course, you can define, as I said, excellence in many ways. Uh, you know, it's, uh, one way to look at it is going back to some wonderful discoveries and breakthroughs that has happened in science and look at uh, the genesis of that, right? How uh, wonderful you know, technologies or scientific discoveries have emerged in, in our lifetime. So uh, th these are some of the you know, points that uh, I thought about. Uh, many, many of these, especially if you uh, look at research, uh, you know, uh, comes from uh, some kind of a seed. Or, or an ideation process, or some seminal ideas that come to our mind, right? And that, that is the beginning, that's the nucleation. You know, in material science, we always talk about nucleation and growth, right? And nucleation is an interesting uh, you know, domain because when there is a phase transformation, nucleation doesn't always occur spontaneously. You know, the nucleus has to grow to a certain size so that it becomes stable. So, you know, again, that's a thermodynamic version of it. Of course, kinetic things could be different, but nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is that there has to be, you know, some ideas that germinate in our mind, and that grows, you know, and, and develops to a particular point. Uh, and of course, in order to sustain this nucleation of ideas, there has to be motivation. You know, well, one of the things that people sometimes ask me when I'm visiting places is, how do you motivate your students? It's a really difficult problem. Right? It's probably the most difficult thing that I face. Now, how do you constantly, for example, somebody who's doing a PhD, his or her, her PhD, you know, over a period of several years, how do you keep motivating them? You know, what is it that you can give in a constant basis to motivate and make them excited, keep them excited? Right? Of course, there are few people, very few, uh, in my opinion, who are inherently motivated, but you don't see them that often. Right? So it has to be the mentor or somebody who is surrounding them uh, to motivate them. So th again, we'll come back to that, but at the end of the day, without motivation, some of these ideas would not uh, be pursued. Uh, and then, you know, if the right conditions arise for, you know, this ideation process and then continue to motivate for a sustainable period of time, breakthroughs can happen, 
you know, significant, suddenly, you know, the Eureka moment can happen. Right? Uh, many of us have seen that, at least I have seen a couple of times in my lifetime, you know, suddenly you see something that you say, wow, I mean, I never expected to see this, right? Uh, it could be that, or it could be, you know, in a systematic way, people can also make significant discoveries that might promote a field, that might change a particular area. <laughs> so I think that that breakthrough moment is also important, and breakthrough discoveries, of course, happen. Uh, but then, you know, it's not always the first observation that gets cemented into something that is sustainable. You know, it, there has to be a validation period. You know, there's been many ideas that suddenly somebody found something in, a, uh, in, in an experiment and it never really uh, was uh, validated. I think that validation experimentation period is very, very important. Right? And, uh, you know, there, there are many, many examples of that, you know, cold fusion, you know, there's so, so many things that people have looked and seen and even published, but never really <coughs> sustained. Uh, so I think it has to go through this, uh, you know, critical experimentation and validation period. Uh, and then there is a piece that involves dissemination. You know, essentially, you know, once it is verified and once it is uh, validated, uh, you tell the people that, uh, you know, this is what is really, uh, the result of all the work and it has validity. Right? So, you know, th these pieces, these points essentially are in the basic science aspect of our research, you know, especially academic research. And then there is another phase altogether that is completely different, and that is taking some of these ideas and bringing it to practice. And, you know, that, that phase is becoming much more important and slowly getting infiltrated into academic research in the recent time whether it is in the us or china or india it's the same story right there is always you know the second phase that has gotten emphasis asking <clears throat> you know people who do fundamental research like me you know what how this technology or how this idea can be translated i think it's very important in, you know and again we all have changed our way of thinking to some extent to accept that this phase is important and, uh, you know, that, that's, again, a more complicated problem. <laughs> and I'll mention a few things in, uh, later on. But, uh, you know, th there is questions about uh, how exactly academic research can be translated into uh, commercialization. And, uh, again, you know, something that we can foster. Uh, there have been many examples on how you could work with uh, people uh, in your institution with different kind of interest uh, to bring some of these ideas into uh, the marketplace. <laughs> now, particularly, you know, this idea of uh, uh, excellence in basic research uh, is interesting because it's also partly to do with the environment and resource uh, uh, you know, allocation and a lot of other things. Yeah, so on the left, you're seeing an interesting uh, chart. This is taken from Nature when it was published a few years ago. Uh, and they were looking at, you know, their best papers or you know, highly cited papers in the past decade uh, and have kind of divided into various different decades. And the idea was to kind of show how this, you know, uh, publications in Nature, again, this is not the only uh, criteria that you could look at, but Nature being one of the highly, uh, you know, uh, recognized journals, it's, it's, it's a good metric to look at. So if you look at these different decades, you can see which countries have done very well and how it has changed. And to a large extent, you can actually see the correlation on how the ecosystem has developed, how, how resource allocation has happened in these countries. So very interestingly, you know, if you look at the 1950s, India features as a block in that chart, right, in that map. Maybe, you know, partly because, uh, uh, you know, uh, that time there were several people, uh, you know, who were trained in certain, in the UK and other places came back and, you know, continued research, but I don't know exactly the details of how, you know, that happened, but certainly India had a lot of basic science papers published in journals like Nature in the 1950s, and it changed. And uh, the domination of Europe kind of gave away to the domination of US because of a lot of migration, a lot of resources that is being put in to research and, and, you know, and the acceptance that basic research is really what is needed for our country. So you can see clearly the, the change that is happening. And then slowly Japan comes into the picture. Again, you know, with the wealth creation, there was also resources available for basic research. 
Uh, and then you can see, you know, small changes here and there, Germany coming into the picture. Uh, and then in the 2000, you can see, you know, US grossly dominates that chart. Uh, but then slowly the, the emergence of China as a power. So again, you know, you, you can correlate, you can actually go back and see, you know, how, how did this happen? How do these, these things happen? Uh, and it happens because of long-term vision and a lot of resources that are being put, you know, uh, to really uh, build an infrastructure, an ecosystem that ultimately creates, uh, uh, you know, outcomes. <clears throat> so very, very interesting. You know, again, uh, I emphasize that nature and this particular chart is not you know, a uh, foolproof consideration, but certainly it gives you an idea of what, uh, you know, how things change with time. Now, this transition from basic research to commercialization is also an interesting one. I'm sure that, uh, you know, many of the students sitting here perhaps would have thought, you know, maybe one day I will build a company based on an idea that I have. And uh, this happens now very commonly uh, in the institutions in India as well, in the US quite well. Uh, but, you know, what, what is interesting is to look at what is called this value of depth proposition. So between these two phases that I described, you know, the, the fundamental research phase and the transition to commercialization, uh, what happens is the, the time period in which these phases can be sustained. Again, you know, sustaining means having enough resources to continue that part, that phase. So, you know, some new discoveries happen, some wonderful ideas come up and, you know, it's validated and it's uh, published or disseminated. And there has to be enough support to sustain that for a certain period of time. And then the other phase, which is kind of disconnected from this, is the entrepreneurs or, you know, the venture capitalists or the people with the interest in, you know, taking this into the practice, uh, starts to put in resources and start to pick up an idea and build it. But they have to kind of be congruent or they have to be contiguous. Otherwise, you have this really danger of falling into this valley where the ideas kind of disappear. Right? Ideas kind of fall into the, the ditch and it doesn't really, you know, it's not easy to pick it up again. So many times we, you know, call it this value of that, which is this uh, discontinuity in the two phases. Uh, one, with basic research and validation and the other being, you know, uh, having resources to kind of commercialize. Uh, but you know there, there are several instances where things have gone very well and you can see many many products now uh, in the market uh, that relates to picking up ideas from the discovery phase and building uh, products <clears throat> now again you know my field has been nanotechnology and i'm going to say a few things about you know the, the early exp experience that i have had uh, particularly in the area of carbon-based nanomaterials uh, and uh, again, you know, it, it's really coming to a point where you can manipulate matter at the atomic scale. Uh, now people have shifted from nanotechnology slowly to quantum technology, quantum materials. End of the day, it's all about how you can control materials, you know, by atom by atom. And if that happens, then there is an enormous potential of really creating ultimately flexible materials. And, uh, you know, Again, my career started when I started to do a PhD, uh, when I went to the US and did my PhD. And uh, it was in the late 80s and you know, ended in 90s. Uh, and uh, those days, the, the, even the terminology nano was not very much used, right? So my PhD was on nanoparticles, but we called it small particles because again, the nano came in the 90s with again, a huge amount of investment from US and other countries. And uh, that became kind of a broadly uh, accepted terminology. Uh, and again, essentially, you know, the, the idea that we generated during my PhD was that particles, when they become very, very small, clusters and so on, are not intrinsically stable structurally. And they can actually change their faces uh, quite rapidly, depending on the energy that is available to the system. So we even called, uh, you know, coined a term called quasi-melting. It's not really melting, but uh, very you know, rapid phase transitions between different phases that small particles can exist in. Uh, and there's been, again, a lot of work uh, based on this idea that uh, uh, very, very small clusters and particles are not intrinsically structurally stable uh, and huge impact in areas like catalysis. 
Now, of course, you know, in terms of this uh, uh, connect between basic science in nanotechnology, which was mostly related to understanding the correlation between structure and properties, and the actual practice, a lot of things have happened, right? And uh, again, in that uh, context, I want to mention this whole thing about top-down versus bottom-up technologies. And top-down technology is what we are very familiar with, things like microelectronics, which has done an amazing job of going down to you know, dimensions that are really very small <coughs> in the nanoscale. And uh, you know, today, if you look at uh, many of the semiconductor devices, uh, they are working in the range of less than <coughs> 10 nanometers. You know, so the next devices that you will find in your computers will certainly have the seven nanometer node, but even maybe further, four nanometer they're looking at. So just to push the limit of top-down technologies, the present day uh, technology has done an amazing job. Uh, but again, the, the long-term perspective is that uh, there will be a confluence of the top-down and bottom-up technologies at some point of time, especially when you're talking about quantum technologies and molecular, uh, or molecular atomic uh, you know, technologies. They will be all essentially, you know, starting with single atoms, single molecules, and they have to be uh, the top-down, uh, so the bottom-up approach. So again, it's an interesting scenario where the bottom-up and the top-down technologies kind of vie for uh, dominance. And uh, right now, it is still dominated by the top-down fabrication. But perhaps there will be a day when self-assembly and other techniques will allow you to build uh, your architectures <clears throat> through bottom-up. And even you know, for many many uh, decades, people have been fascinated by this idea that when you manipulate things at the very small scale. You could have significant differences in properties and significant challenges in controlling uh, you know, physical properties of materials. <clears throat> now, in terms of this bottom up, there's already existing uh, an exciting uh, platform where the bottom up technologies have done so well, and we are all part of that uh, paradigm. Right? And that is the biological bio uh, systems. You know, most of those beautiful architectures and structures are created from the bottom up building process, you know, the chemical uh, mineralization processes and you know, with, with the basic organic chemistry that happens at that scale is what actually has allowed nature to build these amazing things. You know, this is a picture, of course, you know, very much dear to Kerala. Uh, I always show because this is really the uh, quintessential nano engineering in full force. You know, some a material like calcium carbonate, which is super brittle material, uh, you know, taking that almost 99%, you know, of this is calcium carbonate and packaging it into this nano engineered structure essentially made it a super tough material. Right? And this is something that we would love to emulate, you know, from a mechanical engineering point of view, but it's difficult because it's, it's done through this bottom up um, uh, manufacturing approach. <laughs> and essentially, nano platelets of calcium carbonate sandwiched between protein molecules uh, gives us this high tough. In a mechanical behavior because of the super deflection of cracks that goes through the structure. So, I mean, again, there is already what, what I'm trying to say is that existing in nature, this example of this uh, amazing bottom of nano engineering. And that's what I was kind of mentioning that there will be at some point this confluence of the two different approaches in building materials. <laughs> And again, there has been many surveys and reports and so on in, in literature. Uh, this was actually a, a, a survey or a worldwide study that we did uh, at the behest of NSF, National Science Foundation in, India, in the US. Uh, and I was leading that uh, study, uh, trying to see where the whole nanotechnology is going, and how it has been implemented, and what is the uh, you know, uh, typical outcomes uh, in the last decade or two. And you know, uh, the kind of the understanding or at least the acceptance is that uh, you know we have moved away or moved from the basic understanding of nanomaterials and the structure property correlation to more of a system integration uh, level and hopefully the next decade will be the divergence of these technologies into many practical uh, technologies that we'll be using already as i said the semiconductor industry has gone to the less than 10 nanometer node and this is going to happen in many other technologies with nano 
uh, in introduction or the emergence of nano into many of the technologies. <clears throat> now let me come to uh, you know an area that personally was involved from the beginning, and that is carbon nanotubes. And again, uh, Professor Muji mentioned about that. Uh, this is again another excerpt taken from uh, a, a, a nature, another uh, issue of nature, and. There, they did something slightly different. Again, all, all these are interesting uh, statistics. But what they did was, uh, you know, in the period that nature has existed, uh, they chose 10 papers that has made the biggest impact, uh, you know, in a broad range of fields. And, uh, you know, th this kind of goes all the way, uh, the range of uh, topics go all the way from detection of a strange particle to uh, the exponent, uh, the ex ex exoplanet, to uh, you know, cell programming to the discovery of DNA. So that range uh, is significant. And many of these papers were actually first published in Nature and the impact has been uh, you know, tremendous, right? And there were two that was listed as part of the material science uh, you know, topic. And that was interesting. And one of them, of course, is the, 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 the emergence of porous materials, zeolites and things like that. And, uh, you know, of course, now today, there's a significant effort in uh, the metal organic frameworks and the carbon organic frameworks and so on. So I think the idea of uh, assembling and building porous architectures has been really very useful. Uh, it has uh, had huge impact in catalysis and other chemical uh, you know, technologies. But then there is another piece, uh, another paper that they also listed among the top 10, and that was the nano revolution spawned by carbon, the carbon-based uh, uh, nanotechnology. And again, part, part of the reasons why they probably listed all this was you know, based on citations and based on impact. Uh, but uh, the fact that carbon nanotechnology featured in this top 10 was quite amazing. And it was very satisfying for me, for sure, because we were involved in some of the early works in this area. And the, you know, in, in some sense, the dawn of nanotechnology can be kind of connected to the discovery of fullerenes because it's after the fullerene discovery in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, that uh, uh, this nano got so much popularity. Uh, the fact that uh, you can have these amazing structures uh, based on simple carbon, uh, pure carbon, uh, with so much of exciting properties was really uh, a starting point, in my opinion, uh, for the nano revolution. And uh, you know, it happened at Rice. Actually, the discovery of fullerenes happened at Rice by three professors, uh, Smalley, Curl, and Proto, was actually visitors spending some time at Rice. And they came up with this uh, structure of fullerenes. Uh, but the structure of fullerenes uh, is in itself is a story to tell because, um, you know, unlike many uh, discoveries, this happened in a period of time where. Uh, some people had already published uh, you know, mass spec of clusters of carbon, and they had clearly seen the uh, peak at 60 atoms. Uh, you know, this was, there was an Exxon group that published the mass spec of uh, uh, carbon clusters in, in the early 80s, uh, but they were not the people who actually won the Nobel Prize. Right? That is interesting. Uh, and the reason for that is these people who actually showed that there was a strong peak at 60 carbon atom uh, was not really, uh, did not really understand the structure. They couldn't really solve the structure. And, uh, you know, that, that's why the, the Nobel Prize in this discovery went to Smalley, Curl, and Proto, because one, again, the Eureka moment that I talked about, right? It suddenly occurred to them is that perhaps the structure of C60 is this, you know, this is the icosahedra, beautiful structure. Uh, but what is also fascinating to me is that this particular structure has existed for a very long time. It was right in front of you. You know, the soccer ball that people used to use, the early soccer ball, not the new design. It had exactly the same structure, you know, 20 pentagons, uh, 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. And there were many, many architectures that also had the specific structure of the fullerene. So, I mean, to me, you know, the question is, how do you make connections? And, and I think this is a very important lesson to learn in science that uh, you know you have somebody tells you that there is a 60 atom carbon that is a very very stable structure and how do you come to that of course maybe today you have some computational models and things like that that might be predictive uh, but still you know making connections is very important science and uh, this example really is a case in point to tell that you know we should be thinking sideways backwards that's what i was saying in the beginning 
<laughs> and then there was this whole range of carbon-based structures that really captured uh, people's imagination. And if you look at the citations and publications in this field, it's just enormous. You know, I was so fortunate enough to be in at NEC Corporation when the carbon nanotube discovery happened. But then later on, the graphene discovery happened, yet another Nobel Prize in physics. Again, you know, these simple structures, uh, you know, three of them really dominated uh, our research for quite a long time, at least during my lifetime. Uh, and, and even this particular situation is quite interesting because, you know, in, in, a, in a normal sense, uh, graphene is a very uh, easy structure to imagine if you know what graphite is. And graphite is known to most of the people right? because graphene is just a layer of graphite. But then if you look at the, the, the sequence of discoveries, it was fullerenes, which was probably the most complicated structure that one would imagine, happened first, and then came nanotube, and then came graphene. Again, you know, it again tells you that discoveries doesn't really follow any particular sequence. You know, it's just uh, many times it happens serendipitously, and many times it happens from uh, creative uh, outcomes of certain uh, coincidences. <clears throat> Uh, but in any case, uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting story. And yet another interesting story about this is the C60 and related molecules are called fullerenes. Uh, again, a, a very random thing that happened, right? Uh, Fuller, Buck, it's based on the name Buckminster Fuller. Uh, and he had nothing to do with the discovery of fullerenes, but his name is dragged in and it stayed forever, right? Uh, he was actually an architect who was building these beautiful uh, symmetric uh, architectural buildings called the geodesic domes. And they were essentially this, uh, this uh, symmetry of the fluorine. And because there was this relation between the structure of the C60 and the Buckminster fluorine domes, uh, his name got dragged in and it started to be called as fluorines. Again, lucky chap, but I mean, that's, that's the way, uh, you know, serendipity works. And again, it's a point to think about. And then there was very, very many exciting, uh, you know, research that was happening in the early 90s, uh, you know, the nanotube I already mentioned, the first uh, observation of nanotubes were done by Sumio Ijima, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, you know, he was actually not even looking for a nanotube, he was actually looking to see what kind of uh, microscopic images you can get from the soot that generates C60. And, uh, you know, he found these needles uh, and then looked a little bit more carefully and figured out that these uh, structures have these layers of carbon in a cylindrical form, and they are chiral, uh, there's chirality associated with it. Uh, so that, that was kind of a, an interesting observation, but then it became really a fascinating observation because right after that observation, some theorists suggested that this uh, slight chirality that you can bring into this uh, graphene structure in a cylindrical uh, shape and the small dimension gives it significant differences in the electronic structure. So you can have a semiconducting and metallic nanotube depending on the chirality of these nanotubes. So once again, you know, a small tweak in the structure at nano dimension changes significant electronic properties. And that became really a concept that was never shown before. And it was adapted, adopted by many people and nanotubes became kind of famous. And then there were many other papers back to back you know, we, uh, right after the discovery of nanotubes, uh, this was a paper by Sumi Ujima and myself, I was actually a postdoc working in his lab, suggested that there could be even single layer nanotubes. Uh, you know, although we do not have a large scale production, it was just a kind of a suggestion that there could be tubes that are, are as small as a single layer. Uh, and then there were subsequent papers from other groups, NEC and others, that uh, showed that you can actually mass produce single wall nanotubes in large quantities. <clears throat> and we ourselves, you know, uh, Professor Thomas Epperson and myself in the NEC labs also showed that you can do arc discharge method to mass produce uh, carbon nanotubes. So, you know, there, there was always, you know, going back to this ideation, this seminal ideas that arise, observation, and then validation. You know, it was all going through in the early 90s on carbon nanostructure. And the significant results that came out and the fact that people are able to mass produce. You know, even the, the fullerene, the carbon 60, for a long time, people didn't really believe it. You know, I, I was talking about this validation time, this experimental validation is very important because many of these discoveries, you know, sometimes it's so out of the world that you may have a hard time believing. You know, another example is quasi-crystals. When the quasi-crystals came out, 
people did not believe because the five-fold symmetry was not really you know, uh, thermodynamically appropriate for uh, bulk materials. <laughs> it took so long for uh, Shetman to really you know, pursue the scientific community to understand that this isn't possible. I think even Linus Pauling was writing against him in terms of the, uh, you know, the impossibility of this five-fold symmetry in solid materials. And ultimately, it won the Nobel Prize. Right? So I think you know sometimes out of the world discoveries are hard to believe. And similarly, the Fullerenes was also the case. The first few years, people were looking at it with uh, uh, you know uh, very uh, difficult <laughs> to believe. And then the Krashmer and Huffman came out and said that you can actually dissolve the inorganic solvents. And then that was the beginning of the mass production of C60. And that was really the end of uh, the, that uh, you know, chapter. So I think you know all these structures, all these discoveries uh, has certain incubation period, and many times they actually uh, you know survive the uh, the skeptics and ultimately win out. Uh, and then there was also papers in terms of the uh, you know manipulation of these nanostructures. You know we were the first to kind of show that you can not only <laughs> look at nanotube but also look at the nanotube as a reservoir where you can fill materials inside. So you can create nano composites. Uh, again, this was a very serendipitous experiment. Uh, I was in fact trying to look at some metal deposited on nanotubes and looking at the electron microscope. <clears throat> and to get a better contrast, we actually annealed the material uh, at a higher temperature and the metal that we had on top melted and entered the nanotube and it was observed in the microscope. So again, many of these experiments that you see as seminal discoveries were not really intended to be those. Right? So they were all, uh, many cases, serendipitous. And there were multiple papers that showed fascinating things. And again, uh, this is kind of going through my career in terms of uh, publishing things and showing that they could be really pushing the limits. Actually, this is a thing in the Guinness Book of World Record, another Guinness Book of World Record. So again, people, you know, uh, once you have new materials and new structures, you start to really build a story behind it and there are lots of possibilities that you can look at but even then you know going to the second phase that we talked about right you have a material a new material a new discovery uh, how do you really create something that is useful right how do you really transition that into a product or something like that uh, and during the high days of uh, nanotubes richard smalley was fascinated by this he actually after you know after the fullerenes towards the end of his life he was mostly working on nanotubes. And he had these amazing uh, ideas that you could use nanotubes for all kinds of stuff. And he would say things like, uh, you know, I want to create a, a long uh, you know, fishing rod with nanotubes and go fishing. It will be the strongest fiber that you can ever find. <laughs> but then it's not that simple, this translation. And, and that's why this, uh, you know, I mentioned also about this value of death and things like that. So it takes a long time, many, you know, in many cases, for the basic ideas to transition into something practical. And it's only recently, after almost three decades, that now people can spin nanotubes into continuous fibers and use them in many different applications. You know, they still have not optimized it to a point where we can compete with the existing, the best carbon fiber, but that would probably happen in the near future. But it took almost three decades from the ideation of nanotubes to actual practice where you can mass produce, you can spin, you can select chirality, right? So again, you know, we, we should be all patient. Again, that's why I emphasize that uh, academic research should have the foundational aspects as the key uh, aspect, you know, basic science. And uh, you know, the translation could be, again, a long road behind it, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's easy to get confused between what is uh, really academic research about. And then, you know, as, Materials and structures are becoming more complex. Integration also becomes a, a real key part of this. You know, uh, nanotechnology is really one of those technologies which has suffered because of the lack of tools to integrate. Right? I mean, uh, you know, self-assembly we talk about uh, from a, a bottom-up approach, but it's not easy to get defect-free large-scale structures by self-assembly. <clears throat> so you need to have the right way to integrate. And again, uh, you know, the top-down approaches have done very well. Look at uh, again the semiconductor industry is another area that is really telling. <clears throat> you know, the Moore's law has actually flattened in many ways, and the question is really what is after Moore's law? Uh, you know, the, the number of devices really multiplying that fast has really become 
uh, problematic because you can't really integrate more and more uh, with the tools that are available. And then, you know, something slightly different happens. The whole system becomes kind of complex in addition to just uh, scaling down of uh, the, the devices you can also create uh, complexity by adding other things like uh, passive devices power devices sensors and actuators so the next generation of your semiconductor chip would look very different from just the memory uh, <coughs> chip that people always talked about uh, and and that's again in terms of materials and integration uh, is important <coughs> because uh, again, it's, it's orthogonal thinking and how the industry is changing in order to adapt to the various demands that uh, we have today. <clears throat> and also, you know, nanotechnology is really uh, a controlling game. You, know, you have these pieces that are at a very small scale and uh, putting it together uh, is the most complex part. And uh, uh, we have now in the past many decades looked at uh, various uh, building blocks. Uh, there are nano structures, whether it is single wall nanotube, or whether it is a fullerene molecule, whether it is uh, nanoparticles, <coughs> or 2D materials. And 2D materials is something that emerged from the graphene field, and we have been doing quite a lot of work. Uh, but the biggest question is really, uh, how do you really create uh, these integrated structures? Uh, you know, 2D materials are very fascinating because they are two-dimensional. Right? It's a, a atomically thin material, which has a very large lateral dimension. And uh, the best uh, and most promising thing that people talk about is to stack them together to make uh, what they call artificially stacked vandermal structures. And even that becomes very fascinating because what people have found recently is that by having a slight twist in the uh, rotational angle between the layers, you can have some fascinating emergent properties. <coughs> So, you know, I, I'm sure that whoever is working on 2D materials have heard of this, uh, you know, twisted bilayer that undergoes uh, superconducting transition and so on. So correlated structures where, you know, interaction, close interaction of the nanoscale between two layers can create emerging properties. Right? So the engineering, the, the, the whole paradigm of engineering has changed, right? Engineering at the nanoscale is very different from the traditional engineering paradigms that we talk about. Right? Because we talk about things like self-assembly, we talk about things like twisting layers. Right? That's not traditional uh, way of thinking about engineering. Uh, you know, engineers think big scale, and uh, you know they build uh, things with uh, hinges and welding and stuff like that. And, you know, the, the, the whole concept has changed, and that's really fascinating. And you know, somebody said, uh, uh, you know, instead of uh, MBE, uh, it's molecular beaker at the tax. Right. So, you know, the self-assembly approach is different from the vapor phase uh, deposition. <clears throat> How much time do I have actually with that? Maybe 10 more minutes? And, and again, I think there are some real big challenges that, you know, in, term, in addition to the opportunities, some of them I've already mentioned. The challenges are also plenty. You know, we have been thinking about this for a long time. How do I really uh, create larger scale structures from these small building blocks? You know, how do I connect structures? You know, we, we, we've been playing around with graphene and nanotubes for quite a long time. How do I build a three-dimensional, you know, controlled porosity structure from these building blocks if I have to do it bottom up? Uh, it's extremely difficult, but, you know, if you achieve it to some extent, you know, this is an example of a graphene foam where the graphene structures have been interconnected using some covalent chemistry. <laughs> you get some amazing uh, material properties. So this particular graphene foam that has been interconnected covalently shows extreme range of uh, thermoelasticity. So as a material that can be highly flexible and elastic at about 1,000 degrees, and the same material is flexible and elastic at cryogenic temperatures. And again, it, it's because of the nanoscale dimensions of the building blocks and the how you can engineer. Now, I already mentioned, uh, showed you this, uh, the, the shell structure, right? It's a precise nanoscale engineering that brings in value to that structure, not the intrinsic material. Right? So that, again, uh, this nano engineering aspect is now becoming quite uh, uh, fascinating. And then there is a totally uh, you know, new uh, technology that has come into the picture, uh, which kind of conforms to the bottom up building. And that is additive manufacturing, right? 3D printing. I mean, there is no better uh, 
technology for bottom-up building things, layer by layer, than 3D printing. Right? Unfortunately, we still don't have the precision or the resolution at the nano scale, but that's probably going to come very soon. But in terms of scale, you know, 3D printing is amazing, right? You can actually print buildings. There are already, you know, uh, buildings for sale in Austin, Texas, that are completely 3D printed. So, and, and this is really uh, essentially you, you, utilizing, uh, you know, the software that you have, the CAD programs you have, and putting down material wherever you want and building it up layer by layer. Right? And there are also many instances where you can go to very small dimensions. This is a recent paper that we published in Nature Materials on 3D printing of glass. So today, I think in terms of the material uh, and, the, uh, and the dimensions that you can print, you can have a very broad range. And this is really, uh, I think, a, a very practical, not really entirely universal, but at least for many specific systems, you can think about 3D printing as a good alternative to the top-down manufacturing. So because this is really the bottom-up assembly of materials. <clears throat> and then there are many, many examples of materials that can be uh, really, uh, you know, uh, exciting in terms of the engineering aspect, interface engineering, right? I mean, and nature is abundant with this. Uh, we always talk about biomimetic structures and biomimetic structures are fascinating because, you know, biology plays around with very few material systems because, you know, nature has only certain types of materials available. You know, if you look at uh, living beings, you know, they're only the ones that are, uh, uh, you know, available through your food chain, right? For example, you know, our, ourselves, right? We have certain elements that are available, but we don't have the entire periodic table available. So they play around with structure, interfaces, and the dimensionality, the nanoscale. Right? So many of our uh, the structures like bone or shell or teeth, I mean, they're, they're all essentially nano-engineered, right? And uh, so that approach of creating, uh, you know, materials and structures with uh, uh, the, the em emphasizing on the interface engineering is very, very interesting. Now, we, we have been recently talking about this uh, material agnostic structures. You know, can you create... So from structural complexity, can you compensate for material diversity? It's really a very fascinating idea, and nature has already done it. You know, if you want, I mean, they take the same kind of uh, materials, calcium phosphates or, uh, you know, calcium carbonate or stuff like that, and they actually grade their structure. You know, can you grade it and change the mechanical property? Can you make it a little bit more porous here to, you know, accommodate the stresses that you're getting there? Can you create a complex structure so that the stress distribution is the right one, right? So it's, it's a really very different concept of how nature builds materials. And I think we can learn a lot from it, right? And, uh, you know, of course we, we are abundant in materials diversity, so you can actually use the entire periodic table, but you can also bring in this idea of how you can think about this material, material agnostic uh, architectures and structures. <clears throat> And again, interface engineering, I already mentioned to you, uh, one of the experiments that we did a long time ago was this, uh, creating this nano composite where the interface is dynamically tuned. So during loading, the interface keeps changing and actually material stiffens with time. So again, in nature, you can see many uh, examples of materials that are self-stiffening, you know, self-cleaning, right? self-strengthening. So those are real uh, motivation for engineers and scientists like us, especially for materials people, uh, and to think about how, uh, what are the new paradigms that you can bring. And 3D printing is one of those paradigms. You can create complexity, you know, from top-down approach, it's very difficult to create complexity, right? So these tools that are constantly emerging can be useful for uh, these really new type of architectures. And I just want to mention a few things more. You know, facilities and infrastructure is very important you know, to have excellent uh, ecosystem. And uh, you know, today's world, uh, you know, if you really want to work on nano materials, you need to have the tools to do nano characterization and things like that. <clears throat> you know, the microscopes that are extremely expensive, like five, you know, this particular uh, one costs about five million dollars. But you know, if, you, if it's a central facility, it can be extremely valuable. 
and then you can create images that tells you the position of every atom, not only the position, but also the composition of every atom that is in your structure, right? So this is a, a, an image of a 2D uh, alloy, which contains four components. And I can tell the position of every component in the system, you know, and, and this is a molybdenum uh, dichalcogenide system, <clears throat> but you can even tell <clears throat> whether an atom is sitting on the top or the bottom of the layer from contrast that you get and the digitalization and then using things like machine learning. So that's the other thing that has come into picture. You know, the computational part has become very strong. Machine learning and things like that can be used to optimize. The so <clears throat> when you think about you know, doing research <clears throat> at any setting, particularly the academic setting, you know, I think we need to think about all these aspects and, and you have to be active in a collaborative environment. Right. Experimentalists cannot just do experiments. They have to work with theorists to understand what is going on, right? Or maybe work with other people who can do, you know, for example, we are mostly making materials, but we are able to work with people who are making devices so that you can make the best device in the world and experiment with that. And the characterization as well, as you see, is important. And I'll skip a couple of these things, just about 2D materials. <coughs> and I'll just show you one more. Uh, example of these experiments, you know, through, through the many years that I have been in this business. Uh, and this was a really fascinating experiment. And this was done when I was a postdoc at uh, Max Planck Institute uh, in Stuttgart. And again, you know, kind of serendipity. You know, we, we were uh, playing around, we were imaging uh, carbon materials in a very high voltage microscope, so about you know, a thousand volt, one million electron volt microscope. <laughs> and uh, we were looking at radiation damage. And you know, just before uh, we did this work, there was a publication about the carbon onions. Somebody, you know, uh, Ugarte, Daniel Ugarte, he had published with the cover of Nature that uh, you can make these beautiful concentric shell onion-like carbon structure. Uh, and a lot of people were actually uh, fascinated by this beautiful round structure, and they were looking at it. <clears throat> so we did the same thing. We threw some soot in the microscope and you know, hit it with this high electron, uh, high energy uh, you know, electron beam. Uh, the only difference in our case was that we actually had a heating stage in the microscope. So the material was getting heated. And you know, graphitization is an interesting problem. At certain temperature, the material, you know, the defects really become very mobile and the material stays crystalline, even if it is being irradiated. <clears throat> so what happened was that during this joint irradiation heating scheme, the material that we created, this onion-like structure, did not look as disordered as the onions that uh, people were making. There was one difference also, and that was even more striking. If, I, if you look at that image, there is a compression of the interlayer spacing from the outside to the inside, continuously. And in fact, the inner part is so compressed that if you compare the, the, uh, the stress that is needed to compress graphite, it, is about 100 gigapascal, right? In order to compress the 3.4 angstrom separation between graphite layers to about 2.5 that you see here, you need 100 gigapascal if you do it externally under pressure. So that is really crazy that the material is self-organized and in a very, very strange fashion. And obviously, if a material is getting compressed, carbon is getting compressed to that level, what would be the result of that? Well, the resulting thing is that at some point, there is a phase transformation that occurs, and the inner core that is very compressed becomes, you know, undergoes phase transition and becomes diamond. And in fact, it's, it's, it's even more fascinating. I don't have the time to tell the whole story. If you continue to irradiate a diamond graphite interface, the diamond gets stabilized, and I can essentially make this whole particle into a diamond particle. So again, you know, you're observing certain things. I was not really telling this for showing this particular experiment myself, but when you are carrying out an experiment, there are 10 other things that might be interesting as well. So, you know, again, going back to this Gitanjali quote, right? Keep an open mind. You know, I think that's very, very important for students. Uh, as you're doing experiment, think sideways. I mean, I think that there are many things happening. And uh, if you are trained and if you are ready to look at these things in a broad sense, you can really get to some fascinating Eureka moments that I mentioned several times. I also wanted to just uh, show that there are technologies that take time to evolve and become practical. I mean, <laughs> the battery technologies that we have 
been now totally involved in. You know, I think everybody promises that 50% uh, of the vehicles will be EV, uh, electric vehicles, by 2030 or whatever, <clears throat> right? And <clears throat> if you think about it, you know, the whole thing started in the 70s. You know, Stanley Whittingham was the first person to show that there was actually a potential of a metal battery. <clears throat> and then the evolution of the technology, you know, the discoveries of cathodes and anodes, and then the commercialization by Sony in the 90s. Even, even in, you know, it took a long time after the early commercialization to actually make it you know, in this divergent uh, technology that you see today, right? So it took almost uh, 35, 30 plus years for it to be practical technology. And this is what we should all be thinking about, right? Our, the, the, our discoveries are foundational. What we do in our lab and what ideas that we generate and the discoveries that we make are foundational. It could take 20, 30, 50 years for it to be you know, in, in practice. So, you know, I'm, I'm not really saying that we shouldn't try, you know, constantly to kind of, you know, bring some of the ideas into the practice. But in many cases, more important, uh, you know, examples, uh, patience is really uh, important. So that's just uh, battery stuff. <clears throat> so I will, <coughs> I'm going to kind of <coughs> summarize uh, the basic things that I talked about in different aspects and. Uh, different directions. Uh, so, uh, to me, the ecosystem of excellence, particularly for academic research, is like a tetrahedron. <clears throat> I mean, again, you know, maybe there are other points in the polyhedron could grow in dimensions, but you know, to, this kind of captures a lot of the different things that we talked about. And the tetrahedron has six edges, four corners, and four facets. And the six edges, to me, are the, the points that I mentioned at the beginning. So the ideation and knowledge that starts, uh, and, and they're all interconnected, right? The innovation or the motivation, the creativity of thinking out of the box, the training, of course, we have to be ready, and the translation and societal impact that comes as the second phase of that uh, uh, the whole <coughs> uh, process. And then, you know, the facets could be <coughs> the collaborations and the interdisciplinarity or interdisciplinary approaches, Visibility and resource generation, they're all as important you know, because if you lack any one of those, you can see that the whole pyramid kind of collapses, right? I mean, you know, particularly things like visibility. So we, we do a lot of, uh, you know, constant uh, uh, you know, striving in the U.S. to make ourselves visible. I think, you know, either through media outlets or outreach, you know, we go constantly to schools nearby and talk to the students. And that's also a huge uh, drive to get younger people, you know, uh, K-12, <coughs> to get to science and engineering. Because we can see that certainly the interest among very young people in get, getting into science and technology is waning. You know, whether it is in India, whether it is in the U.S., uh, that, that is happening. So I think we, we are the practitioners. We are the champions of this uh, science and engineering. We have a responsibility, a social responsibility to go and connect to the young generation and tell them that these are exciting. <clears throat> and there are lots of exciting things in science happening today. You know, I think they, they, the young people will be excited for sure. And then of course, you know, the, the corners, the corners are the facilities <clears throat> and the human resources, faculty, students, I mean, places like this, uh, I think that's not an issue at all. <clears throat> and then leadership. I, I think, you know, I've seen many times that the leadership is extremely important to keep this tetrahedron going. Right? Because I think you know wrong policies, wrong uh, <coughs> you know approaches can really destroy uh, the structure that uh, we, we build in. And one thing that is <coughs> also <coughs> important, perhaps more challenging in some places, is incentivizing what you do. <coughs> uh, of course, in the U.S., it's much more easy because it's a more flexible system. And uh, you know, how do you incentivize people to continue to do research uh, and produce and be motivated. I think, you know, those are at least from my point of view, the, the, the tetrahedron that ultimately creates this ecosystem. <clears throat> and, and the last piece is, you know, the, the department that I mentioned that we built six years ago, <clears throat> and it's really a very small department. You know, we started from scratch and right now we have only seven faculty, but I'll tell you the kind of, <clears throat> you know, research that we do, the publications. You know, this is just taken for the last three years from our core faculty. You know, just uh, we have many joint faculty, and they are, of course, 
outside uh, the scope of these publications, but you know, our core faculty, very small number, excels in doing you know, the high quality research, publishing in the best places. Uh, again, I, I, I want to you know, say this again, that publications and metrics like H indexes and all are not the only criteria, but in whatever areas that you can excel, it's important so that you are visible and your students become uh, you know, easy targets uh, for other universities to accept. Uh, and they can go anywhere in the world because you're coming from ISA to AMP, right? So I think you know, the, the, <clears throat> the standards and the excellence that you want to create is very important, not just for your own existence, but for uh, the, the students and the, uh, the generation of those students who will go from this place. Uh, and you know, it's, a, it's a joint effort. Again, the sense of belonging, I want to bring that again. I think it's extremely important, right? You feel part of the system, be part of this institution, and you're all proud of that. Uh, and that's really the final message. And uh, again, I want to remind that, you know, science and engineering is not really a single person's work. I never felt any time that, you know, I have really accomplished something big uh, or whatever, uh, you know, if you publish something, it's built on, generations of work, right? you, you are not really doing this out of the blue. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's very important to recognize that and you know, work together, collaborate. You know, I think those are some of the ideas that I thought when I was asked to give this kind of a uh, more general motivational lecture. So thank you very much for listening. I think the weather has turned even better. What I'm looking for is perhaps an elephant appearing from the forest, but that may not happen. Thank you very much. That's okay. I think uh, it's a much needed, very motivational and enlightening talk by Professor Rajayan. I think as I was going to summarize, but then he put up a slide which pretty much summarizes everything that he talked about, right? From starting from ideation to, is it okay? Am I audible? I guess I'm audible. <clears throat> starting from ideation to, well, motivation and then taking it forward eventually looking at translation uh, which is really uh, you know an arduous task and from what he said you know taking his own area showing the progression i think uh, translations to the benefit of the society can be really decades but i think science is exciting at the end of the day i think he you know the passion with the passion with which he has you know carried on uh, his researches was amply evident from his presentations. And of course, a take home message is that the simple materials that we witness everywhere, right, we, we don't worry about it. That the shell that he talked about, if you, if you think about it, how simple atoms, when they get together, get into structures that become superstructures with uh, astounding properties is something really amazing. That's what science is. There's no question. I think it was a fabulous talk and very enlightening uh, uh, talk. Uh, we are going through the midst of pandemic, but nothing like getting together for science, which is always exciting. Please join me in thanking Professor Ajayan for a wonderful uh, talk. Thank you very much. Well, I think uh, it's my pleasant duty in appreciation of wonderful talk to give a small, give away a small souvenir from our place. This is a, by the way, an institute lecture. So I think uh, you know, it's a, a proud privilege for us to have our institute logo with a black belt. I had a rather small school in Kerala, and when I come there, I would like to see that. <laughs> Thank you.